Hello and welcome to the Astranti Strategic Analysis video for the November 2016 case study on dairy farming company ADF. Now quick introduction to the case for those of you who perhaps haven't read it yet. The dairy farming industry is the main focus for this sittings pre-seat. Now dairy farming is an interesting choice because it's something that we're probably very aware of. It's something we know exists. We all know what cows are. We all know what milk is. We all know what yogurt and cheese is, etc. But do we really know the logistics behind it? What goes into the dairy industry? What goes into getting the milk from the cows to the bottles of milk in the supermarket? And therefore, it's a relatively interesting case for us to look at. And I've got a brief introduction here as to what ADFR, so summarizing ADF, they're a reasonably successful but small company based in Hilland. They are a family owned entity. They own four farms, approximately 1,600 dairy cows, and Hilland is one of the leading milk producing countries in the world. So now let's take a look at ADF and the various models in which we're going to use to analyze the case. And we're going to use this using this overarching model called the rational model. Now, essentially, this is taking a look at where we want to be in the future. Where do ADF want to be in the future? Where they are now? And then how they are going to get there. And you can see here the various models within each section. So in the future, we're going to look at our mission, our objective, governance, ethics, stakeholders. In the present, we're going to look at five forces in the industry, pestle for the external industry, and also internal analysis of our strengths and our weaknesses. And finally, we're going to look at how we're going to get from A to B, how we're going to get from where we are now to where we want to be in the future using models such as Porter's generic strategies and soft matrix and the general methods of growth. So let's kick off by looking at where we are now. Where are ADF at the moment? I'm going to start by looking at mission statements. Now, it was unusual in this particular case that there wasn't a mission statement. Usually in a strategic exam, we are given more information about what the company wants to achieve. It was worth noting as well that it was an odd case for a strategic case study. Usually strategic case studies are larger multinational organizations. So it was peculiar that it was a small family owned business this time. And a mission statement is a useful thing because it tells everyone involved with the organization, all kinds of stakeholders, people who are not even at all impacted by the company or involved in the company. It tells them about what the organization is all about. Why does the company exist? Who does it exist for? What is it trying to achieve? So what is ADF trying to achieve? Does it want to be a leading milk producer? Is it happy being a leading independent milk producer? Does it want to just simply provide a source of income for the family? They, they have no grand designs on becoming a larger company, becoming a public company, etc. They just want to provide a sustainable income, a sustainable career, sustainable profession for the family for generation after generation. Of course, the family has been involved in the company for 150 years, and it could be they just wish to continue with that cycle. But even if that is the case, that does not necessarily mean that they cannot have a mission statement. It doesn't mean that they do not exist for anything, because if they do exist for that purpose, then that is their purpose still. Just because it doesn't have any kind of grand ambition in their mission statement doesn't mean that it's not an effective mission statement. And the main theory that we can use here for mission statements is Campbell's four elements. And as you can see here, Campbell's four elements are the purpose, the strategy, the values, and the policies. Now, basically a mission statement should be fairly ambiguous and it should just generally summarize the overall direction in which the company is heading, but it should satisfy these four individual purposes or four individual elements, sorry. 
So first of all, purpose. Why does the organisation exist? Who does it exist for? Well, it exists to provide milk. It exists to provide good quality milk, good produce. And what do people use milk for? People use milk for their general health. Milk is considered to be quite healthy. It's high in calcium, etc. People feed it to their children. It's seen as part of a good breakfast. So it's all about providing a healthy, high quality produce to the general populace. And what does the company wish to achieve in the long term? Well, they've shown signs that they wish to grow, that they wish to expand. They're one of the largest independent farms in Hillland, but they still pale in comparison to the size of some of the larger corporation dairy farms. And it doesn't show, or the reason didn't show that they had any ambition to become one of those larger corporations. Perhaps they are happy being the largest independent, or one of the largest independent ones. Maybe they wish to become the largest independent family owned farm in Hillard. But of course, given that they've kept it within the family for so long, it could be that they just wish to continue that. And in the long term, they hope to maintain a sustainable farm that can be run by the family for generation after generation. And how are they going to compete to achieve this? What is their strategy to achieve this? Well, obviously, they need to remain profitable. Of course, this is difficult in this industry because the supermarkets have so much power. It is also very difficult to differentiate when it comes to milk. Milk is milk. Milk comes from cows. All cows, well, not all cows are the same, but generally milk produced from one cow is mostly the same as milk produced by another. So it's very difficult to compete by diversifying your product. Often it's a generic product, you have to compete on price. Now, of course, the supermarkets drive down the price. The larger corporations who can achieve economies of scale are more likely to be able to match that price. The smaller family-owned farms are more likely to be squeezed out by this. And therefore, perhaps the company does need to look at diversifying their product range. Perhaps they could produce a branded milk similar to, say, Cravendale. Perhaps they could sell their milk to companies that manufacture dairy-based goods rather than selling the milk straight. Perhaps that they could invest in new machinery so that they can produce the milk on site rather than just shipping it off in its form in a tanker, in a third-party tanker to the supermarket who then do further pasteurization to it, who then do further skimming to it. If they could do that on site, then perhaps that would open up their potential customer base because at the moment only the supermarkets can probably afford to do all of that extra skimming, all of that extra pasteurization, all of that extra transport and other logistics as well. So therefore they are perhaps limited in who they can sell to. They can't sell to the smaller independent outlets at the moment because those outlets don't have that equipment on site. Then we have values. Now values is about what the organization stands for. Now, does it stand for quality, value for money, or innovation? Now, obviously, in the milk industry, there's not necessarily that much room for innovation. The, the milking industry, the dairy farming industry has been around for hundreds of years. There has been innovations in terms of intensive farming, in terms of the, the milking machines. But the general gist of the industry, getting, cows from, uh, getting milk from cows, has been around for centuries. But perhaps they could compete on quality. They could compete on having you know, the lowest amount of antibiotics and bacteria or other things like that in milk being extra filtered, extra clean as it were. It could be that they compete by moving away from intensive farming to a more ethical treatment of the animals and that perhaps could be a way in which they could achieve this uniqueness that would help them to diversify their customer base, diversify their product base, etc. Because currently they use intensive farming practices which are done by basically every milk company in Hilland. It was the industry standard, this standard practice of the dairy farming industry in Hilland to use this intensive farming techniques. So by moving to a more ethical treatment of the animals, they could perhaps get a unique selling point from that. And finally, we have policies. Now, these are policies that which people 
in your organization are expected to follow. So they link back to the values, the strategy and purpose. These are ways in which you then ensure that your staff act relative to the purpose of your organization, act relative to the strategy of your organization, act relative to the values of your organization. Now, companies such as Johnson & Johnson, they have these credos relating to their mission, relating to their objectives. And if you go into one of their offices, they have the credo plastered on the wall as soon as you walk into the building. So everyone who enters that building knows about the values of the organization, knows the purpose of the organization, knows the strategies of the organization. So they're constantly reminded of it. And as such, they expect people to follow those purposes, follow those strategies, follow their values. So the company, and as part of their mission, as part of their objectives, need to ensure that whatever the board decide on, whatever they want to achieve in the long run, that staff are on board, that everyone involved with the organization, all kinds of stakeholders are on board with what the organization wants to achieve. So that's missions. What about performance measurement? Performance measurement is indicative of objectives, is indicative of mission statements, because essentially, whilst that is your, your overall aim, your overall the overall place in which you want to be. Performance measurement is almost measuring how well you're doing in terms of getting there. So, for example, if you wish to become more profitable, you need to then measure how profitable your organization is, how you know, much your profit is growing, how much it's decreasing, the profitability ratios, uh, revenue against costs, etc. all needs to be looked at. And what I've done here is broken it down by the balanced scorecard. And that scorecard is in a sense a method of looking at more than just the financial performance of the organization. It also takes into account general internal perspectives to the development of your organization, your customers, and also your learning. So this ties into innovation, ties into training, it ties into the operations of your organization as well, the success of your operations. And so I split up some various performance measurement metrics here by financial learning, internal and customer perspectives. So let's take a look. So financial perspective, a bit clearer, obviously, this is basically the money of the organization. So how much profit is the company making? We saw there was a big decrease in profit this year. So that's not a good thing. The net profit at the end of the year was down 55%. A return on investment is another way of measuring financial perspectives. If they were to say, invest in the business plan or invest in other opportunities, we would then have to measure how well or how much money we return from them. We don't want to just get our money back. We want to have gained from doing this. So using you know, net present value calculations, IRR calculations, etc., to help summarize whether we have made a decent return on investment. Cash flow and gearing are very important metrics of the financial perspective as well. Cash flow obviously being how much liquidity moving through your organization. Liquidity is obviously important if you have to make purchases out of nowhere, you need to have money for that. Gearing as well is the level of debt funding within your organization. The more debt funding you have, the more risky your organization is, and also the you'll find it harder to raise additional financing because of the fact that you're high risk. A bank is unlikely to lend you more money if you already have a lot of debt financing because it's too risky of an investment on their behalf. Now, from an internal perspective to the various operations of your organization. So obviously is a fairly labor, in, well, not labor intensive, um, but the things that require labor do require labor. So it's important that we use our employees well, that we keep our employees satisfied. So the utilization rate of employees, it spoke in the precinct about how they you they're used to supervise the milking process and the milking process approximately takes five hours out of every day in two, two and a half hour sessions. But during the break in between, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, cleaning and various things like that. But does that require all the employees that we have on staff who are working that particular day to do it? So we need to perhaps look at whether or not we are utilizing our employees enough. 
Are they perhaps doing, uh, utilizing, not utilizing, uh, are they perhaps building up some downtime during that period? And if so, do we need to readjust our, our shifts, etc., so that we are always getting full use out of each employee? Because if, if an employee is you know, in downtime, then we are paying them and we are not getting the full benefit of their work, of their labor. Uh, job completion rates as well. Now it said that and job success rates. Uh, so this could be tied to milking. If you have a certain target of how much milk you need to uh, get per milking session, then if you are above that or you're on target, then no, that's a successful milking. If you're below that, perhaps that wasn't a successful milking. Now you need to look at why. Are uh, some cows not producing enough milk? Uh, is some milk being wasted because it's just spilling because the things that connect to the udders of the cows are not on tightly enough, are the pipes leaking, etc. And also uh, the time as well, it's supposed to take two and a half hours. If it's taking more than two and a half hours, then that links back to employee utilization rates. We need the employees to be finished in two and a half hours so they can do the other things in between the milking sessions. And this, of course, goes back to money here with being under budget or how we are doing in terms of doing the job on budget. If we go over budget, then perhaps we haven't been working as efficiently as possible. We've been doing this for a long time, so it should be that we should be able to accurately predict how much something costs approximately. It's not a brand new job for us. It's not a brand new project, the milking of cows. It's something that the company has done day in, day out for a hundred years. We've also brought in wastage rates and carbon efficiency. A wastage being related to the milk. Obviously, if the milk has been milked and then is not sent out quickly enough, if it's in storage for too long, it could go off and therefore it's been wasted and we've got no revenue from that. I've also put recycling and carbon efficiency on here because, as with everything, there is more of a social um, obligation on companies to act with respect to the environment, particularly for a dairy farm. Obviously, cows are renowned for perhaps not being particularly environmentally friendly animals. The waste they produce can pollute land, it can pollute uh, pollute the water supply, the gases they produce can pollute the ozone layer, the uh, all this sort of thing. So therefore it's very important for um, companies that work in this industry to perhaps illustrate to the public, to their stakeholders, that they are environmentally friendly. And finally, employee satisfaction, obviously very important. Important particularly in this industry because of it being in a rural location, uh, they're being paid the minimum wage. A lot of people might be reading it thinking, well, if you're being paid minimum wage to work in a dangerous industry in the middle of nowhere, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you go and get the same wage or higher in you know, a city where there's things to do? And that also ties in with the learning perspective now. So that ties in with hours spent training our employees. Training is a way in which you can build an employee's value up it's a way in which you can build satisfaction from the employee because they feel that they are getting something from the job beyond their pay. The number of training projects that they've completed. If, you, if for example, when they first start, you say, well, by the end of the year, we want you to be trained in this, trained in that, trained in this. And therefore, you are then showing yourself to be dedicating to the future development of those employees. And at the end of the year, you can check off how many of those projects the employees went through and whether you've met the target or not. I also have the disease and mortality rates of the animals as well. Obviously, in the dairy farming industry, the lifeblood of the industry is the livestock, it is the cows, and disease can be devastating to the animal, not just to each individual animal, but obviously it can spread, particularly in, under intensive farming regulations, uh, intensive farming industries where the cows are all packed together, the disease can spread very quickly and it'd be very detrimental to the organization. And also from a animal rights perspective, we owe um, 
an obligation to the cows to ensure that they are looked after well, to ensure that they do not suffer from disease. So our ability to keep them disease free, to keep disease from spreading, to keep the cows from dying is also very important perspectives to measure our organization on. And finally, customer perspectives. Obviously, if you if you have no customers, then you have no business. You're just wasting money because a company needs revenue. So the number of customers we have is important and how satisfied they are. And you can measure that from a survey or by the number of complaints. If you have two customers and both have complained, then chances are you're not doing well from a customer perspective. If you have 2,000 customers and two complain, then perhaps you are doing well from a customer perspective. Now, this one is particularly relevant because I think it's one that the company needs to improve on. Uh, it could do this by various other ways of selling different products or selling the same product, but you know, enhancing it more and being able to sell to more independent places. The problem with the company at the moment is it only sells to the major supermarkets and the major supermarkets have too much power. So it's very difficult for them to not do whatever the supermarkets want. So now we move on to governance. Now, governance is generally prevalent throughout most case study exams. And essentially, governance is the way in which organizations are directed, they're administered and controlled. Basically, it was born out of lots of scandals, particularly in the 1980s, where companies had been run by corrupt CEOs who had been in it for themselves. And of course, this arises because directors are agents of the owners. The owners own the company and they employ directors to run the company for them. But of course, directors may often want to run the company in their own interests or if they're perhaps being paid a bonus by getting a certain amount of growth, they may leverage the long-term performance of the organization to achieve that short-term growth so they can get their bonus and move on to the next organization. And it's worth noting that this is only mandatory for listed companies in the UK. But that doesn't mean that other organizations can't get something out of it because of course this is designed to be the best way in which an organization is directed, administered and controlled. So just because it's not mandatory doesn't mean that uh, the companies can't get something from it. And so we have a few principles here of good governance, such as there being a separate chairman and CEO, CEO being head of the company, chairman being head of the board, who are in turn head of or uh, in charge of the CEO and the company. So the whole point of this is to separate the powers out so that not one person has too much control of the organization because power leads to corruption, etc. Independent non-executive directors. So these are people who are not employed by the company. They are brought on to the board as independent eyes. They do not have a stake, so to speak. They are not going to be negatively affected by the performance of the company. They do not rely on this company to provide their salary, so to speak. So they are just there to provide an objective viewpoint. Audit nomination and remuneration committee. So these are committees that are sat on by non-executive directors. So you generally have to have a non-executive director to have these committees. And the audit committee basically checks the risk management of the organization. They run internal audits to see that the company is working as it should. There is no risk uh, that they are minimizing the risk of fraud, etc. Nomination committee is the committee that decides which directors, executive directors are appointed to the board. This may be externally or may be through from the senior management of the organization being promoted up to board level. The point being that the nomination committee ensures that the right person is selected for the job. So we uh, minimize the risk of nepotism, of cronyism, for example, or people just being brought up to directorship level for the sake of it. It basically it means that anyone who gets appointed to the board has to be has to be proven to be the right person for the job. They have to have the relevant skills. And remuneration committees decide on appropriate pay for the directors. So rather than just 
saying, well, you know, we did okay, we've given this director this amount in the past, so we'll just give that to him again. They may say, no, we don't feel that they deserve that much remuneration this time because they made some mistakes, etc. And some other principles of governance are things such as making sure that directors have good, have all the right information to make decisions, that they are never making decisions without having all the right information, getting the right information from the various management accountants and senior managers of the organization. Again, this is somewhat controlled by the non-executive directors. And also to ensure that all directors are involved in decision making, sometimes with large listed organizations, public organizations, the founders of the company are often still involved in it. And some directors will think well, the founders will know what's best because it's their company or they don't want to go against them because they have the most shares and therefore the most power, etc. So they don't speak up. So one of the, the points of this, of ensuring that all directors are involved, is it minimizes the chance of the CEO, the chairman, the founders being too powerful. And also, Regular meetings with institutional shareholders, maybe pension funds, etc., and the AGM, which of course is everyone. Anyone who has just a single share in an organization has the right to attend the annual general meeting. So I hope you've enjoyed this sample video and more importantly found it useful. Before I go, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few of the products that we do here at Astranti Financial Training, specifically for our case study courses. We have a study text which details all the key theories in which you will be expected to use in your case study exam, as well as details of how to approach the pre-scene and the case study. We also have a series of course videos detailing how to answer case study questions. This is actually an area in which many students struggle. Most of the scripts that I've seen, the failing scripts that I've seen, has actually been due to poor case study technique rather than lack of knowledge. We also have a series of pre-scene analysis videos based on the current up-to-date pre-scene detailing all the key bits of information and likely issues you may face in the exam. Next up is the industry analysis, a pack detailing information about the industry that the precinct company resides in, information about the key players within that industry, and more background information on the industry in general. We also have a range of mock exams created for each level and based on the current precinct, which is a great way to get some practice in before you sit the real thing. We also offer marking and feedback on those mock exams so you can see where you are going wrong and where you can improve. Finally, we have the master classes. These are two one-day classes taken by our expert tutors to give you all the, the hints and tips you need to really add to your chances of passing the exam. Also, if you take our full course, we offer a pass guarantee, which provided you have met all the requirements of the pass guarantee, you will get a free reset on the next exam should you fail to pass. So once again, thank you for your time. If you're interested in any of these products, please visit the website www.astranti.com for more information. Thank you.